Hey, Jim, you can start now. Great, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for joining our satellite session today from whatever part of the world you're in. We hope that you'll find the session interesting and engaging. And our session is titled, Where is the Local Voice in Academic Global Health? Reimagining how we produce and consume research. We'll explore the structure of academic global health. A consequence of its current structure is that research is largely written for a global audience and by those from the global north, often excluding local perspectives. The question we'll examine is the following. Is the current paradigm salvageable for the production and consumption of academic global health? I'm Jim Ricca and I'll be moderating the panel. You can see my background on the, uh, on a slide that we'll show later on, so I won't go over that. Um, in the interest of time and efficiency, um, I'd like all those who've joined us today to introduce themselves in the chat. I think there's um, that's a possible you know thing that people can do. Uh, I think we have few enough that that will be something that would be uh, good to see where everyone's from. Um, and uh, I'll introduce each of our panelists in turn, who will look at the issue uh, from different perspectives. Next slide, Natalie. I just wanna go over a little housekeeping here. Um, first, you can see the support chat function in the top right corner um, of the page at any time, if you face any technical issues. Um, the, uh, there's a Q&A session that we'll have at the end you can send your questions in the live Q&A session next to the screen, addressing the speaker by name. If it's for all panelists, please let us know. Um, for the best user experience for the virtual conference, please view this in full screen. Um, these sessions are recorded and they'll be available uh, to view the next day and will remain available for 14 days post-conference. Um, and please adjust your browser zoom ratio to 67% um, to play the session in full screen by selecting the enlarge icon on the top right of the session window. So um, next slide, Natalie. So this is me, uh, like I said before, just a quick bio. Um, I'm both uh, part of the momentum Country and Global Leadership Project, which is USAID funded and a um, associate editor of uh, Global Health Science and Practice. You can see the rest of my bio here. Um, next slide. We're going to start uh, with uh, Dr. Shaya Bembala. Um, he is our moderator. Unfortunately, he can't join us live because of the time difference in Australia where he lives but he has recorded his session. Dr. Abembla is the Editor-in-Chief of BMJ Global Health, and he's been a global leader on the issue at hand. We can see his brief bio on the slide that's up now, and we'll pay, play his pre-recorded session where he will frame our discussion in terms of the voice and the gaze, um, some people would call it the perspective, that we observe in the current global health paradigm. Natalie, if you're able to play Shai's video now, that would be good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining our satellite session today. Um, I hope it's going to be an exciting session of interesting um, discussions. Um, we will be talking about um, how we might reimagine knowledge platforms for global health. And I should start by saying a big thank you to uh, my fellow panelists and also to Jim Ricker, who is going to be the moderator for the session. I will chair this session, but unfortunately, um, remotely, and in fact, um, uh, by recording my session because of time differences. I am Shaya Bimbola, and I am a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney in Australia, and also the editor-in-chief of BMJ Global Health. I'm also currently the Prince Claus Chair um, on Justice in Global Health Research at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. 
and I maintain relationships, um, some working, some friendly relationships with colleagues at the National Primary Health Care Development Agency. Um, the, the first place that I think we need to start thinking about how we might reimagine um, um, knowledge platforms for global health is um, to begin by trying to define quite a bit clearly what the problems are with the current platforms. And I think there are two kinds of problems that, that, are, uh, that, that plague um, the current platforms that we have. The first is a problem of representation. Um, and, and there are lots of ongoing debates and studies that highlight this very um, present and persistent issue. Uh, and proposed solutions are bound, um, and, and they include um, the, a call to, to academic journals and to funders of research and to universities to mandate the inclusion of local authors on work done within their local setting, um, to change the incentives for, for academic um, careers such that high income country academics can give up choice authorship positions to, to academics from elsewhere. And also uh, to support low and income country academics to engage more um, in equitably, more equitably in partnerships and to change the criteria for authorship so that more roles um, and contributions are recognized on, on the list of authorships of academic papers. And, and to also increase the diversity of editorial boards of journals. And I'm sure that um, some of uh, the fellow panelists uh, um, to whom you listen um, after my presentation will speak to different initiatives that they've been involved in um, to address some of these issues. However, uh, my sense is that um, it is possible to put all these measures in place um, and give ourselves on the back, a pat on the back, without having solved what I think of as the second problem, which is a problem of gaze. Um, and it's a problem that I think leads us to ask a very important question. That is the current format that the literature in global health takes. Is it fit for purpose? Uh, and what kind of equitable authorship is indeed desirable? Um, and when we think about these questions, where it leads us to really is uh, where did the current format of scientific academic publishing come from? And indeed, to ask ourselves, does it serve us well in global health? And without uh, uh, exp showing my hand too much, I'm sure you can sense what, what my answer to these questions will look like. But, but let's start by, by trying to look at the origins of academic and scientific journals. Um, perhaps the first uh, um, journal that would have described itself as an academic scientific journal was the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which began in 1665. Now, there were similar-ish entities that began around the same time. There was one in France, for example, but I think it was the philosophical transactions that actually did start the, what we now know as the current peer review system, uh, which in, in many ways defines the way we think of academic journals today. And it, it started in part because there was a growing circle of men of knowledge. Of course, there were men at the time, um, European men, who needed a way to communicate um, remotely among each other and a way to legitimize um, what um, their colleagues claimed to have discovered. Now, the premise of those scientific journals, uh, very, it's, it's very important point to make, is that knowledge is universal. In fact, in the manifesto, in the, in the, in the document that announced the, the founding of the philosophical transactions, there was this sense that knowledge was universal, knowledge is generalizable, uh, and, and indeed, uh, it is true for, for the kind of science that they were doing at the time. They, a lot of what we were doing is discovering gases and, and, and the refractive index of lenses and, and things like that. There were sort of things that would remain true wherever it, it was you were <laughs> trying to look at them, uh, whether it was in London or in Paris or in Rome. Uh, and this sense of what science is and what the purpose of knowledge generation is um, made its way, of course, into biomedicine. And, and eventually into what we now call medical journals, uh, which were founded about 200 years after. Um, and of course, then to public health and global health journals, which are founded you know, about another few decades after um, uh, medical journals made, made their first appearance. But it's important to think more clearly, really, about what the premise of public health and, and global health is, which I think is quite different, and, and this is a big claim to make, but it's an important claim to make as well, 
that, that for public health and for global health, knowledge is local. Even if it's also at the same time universal. In other words, if you want to solve the problem of an outbreak in London, you needed knowledge from London to solve the, the, the problem of that outbreak. Whilst knowledge about the nature of such an outbreak from Paris and from Rome and from Lagos and from Delhi will be useful, ultimately you needed to ground them in certain local realities which required a certain local understanding of what knowledge really is. Now, uh, I've used the word global health several times in this talk already, so it's, it's important to step back a bit to, to make very clear what I mean by that term uh, and, and how that connects to, to, to the role of knowledge in global health. So if we think of global health as any effort anywhere to reduce or eliminate health inequities between individuals or groups, right? whether it's in high-income countries or middle-income countries or low-income countries, um, and the effort may be entirely local, or may involve people from elsewhere, but it is always political, and politics is always local. And I think recognizing this very important premise of the work that we do leads us to ask the question if our current knowledge infrastructure is well matched to that mission. And if, 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 if we try hard enough to answer that question, I think you would also have to engage in what I think of as an imaginative exercise, which I hope will be part of what the discussions following um, this talk and, and, and presentations with uh, other panelists will be, um, in, in trying to imagine what a locally grounded knowledge infrastructure would look like um, for, for global health and for public health more broadly. Now, I, I try to, to, to separate two kinds of, of change. Um, uh, so two kinds of problem uh, that are at the heart of global health into two. Again, these two categories are, they're not natural categories in that they, they don't separate easily, but, but it's, it's a useful heuristic um, device to, to, to have this discussion that, that, that I'm about to have. Um, uh, and I took it, the idea from, from a, a series of essays by, by the writer C.S. Lewis, who, who separates uh, the kinds of change that you may have in a system into surgical change and organic change. Um, and it, what it meant by organic change is that the kind of changes that are very local and contextual and requires long engagement with, with politics and with negotiation and with different groups to make something happen. And surgical change is kind of change that you can introduce from the outside or, or can be very specific and targeted and may not require a lot of contextual uh, mess, as it were. So you can think of a surgical change as the kind of change that is driven by a new vaccine, a new drug, a new guideline. You can have an RCT evidence that gives you exactly what you need to know, and that knowledge can be universal, can be generalizable, can be contextualized, and can be proven to have been effective once and for all. And often we call these kinds of problems um, uh, discovery problems, and problems that this kind, this kind of solution um, is well matched to. But there's also the, as I said, the organic kind of change, and which often is, is tied to delivery projects. How do you ensure that a government or an NGO or the private sector or communities uh, uh, facilitate equity, that their actions and their decisions and their relations lead, lead to equity? And for this kind of, of change and for this uh, solving this kind of problems, you need knowledge that is local and contextual, that it involves local learning and retooling and negotiation. And in this kind of knowledge, when you think about how global health works now, in fact, the global learns from the local, insights trickle up. Whereas for, for, for the kind of knowledge you get in surgical change, you can pretty much uh, um, discover what the solution is at a remove, right, from, from the setting or from, from the site or the location where you want to solve the problem and essentially introduce that solution um, to, to solve the problem. And as I'm sure you can both can tell already, um, that, that these two are complementary. They're not sort of they're not as far apart and, and distinct from each other as, as that the previous slide might have suggested. But, but it's important to also make the claim, and again, it's another big claim. But even though um, uh, the surgical almost always needs the organic, um, it is not often the same vice versa. In other words, if we are trying to order the importance of these two kinds of solutions or change in, in, in systems uh, uh, to achieve equity, 
um, we will we will make the organic kind of, of change far more important than the surgical. Whilst of course surgical remains really very very important. And if, if you read any historical account of how universal health coverage is achieved anywhere or how equity is achieved or not anywhere, um, the, the central theme of any such account will be that change is total and and, 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 and the most important point I think to make at this point in this, in, this, in this talk is that the literature that we have as currently constructed and valued is inadequate for the needs of the kinds of organic change um, that, that I think we need to pay a lot more attention to. Um, and another point to make here is that people know much more than what the literature knows. Again, when you think about the kinds of, of, of processes that are involved in organic change, it, it, it goes without saying, uh, that, that the knowledge is embedded in action. Uh, and if we want to use that kind of knowledge better, then we need to think of new platforms and new ways of using knowledge and thinking about knowledge. Now, this one of one of the, the, the I've struggled to, to, to define for myself really um, uh, very clearly uh, how to frame the role of academic journals. But, but I stumbled on, on this really lovely quote on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, and I'm still struggling to find who actually said it. But, but it is that if you want a system or a group of people to be healthy and in learning, you have to connect that system to more of itself. Right? So if you think of, 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 of the kinds of problems that we want to solve in global health and the kinds of organic problems we want to solve, really, ultimately, what we are trying to do as people who create and generate knowledge as people who use knowledge as people who transmit knowledge from place to place is to make sure that we have a system that is capable of connecting a system more with itself right if we think of this as the primary purpose of, of our knowledge infrastructure in global health and, and we think of that as the primary purpose hopefully of of journals um, um which is to facilitate the kind of learning and the kind of change um, that are caused by connecting the system more with itself. Then, then it becomes clear that, that the, the, the current structure that we have is not as well equipped to do that as we might want it to be. Right? Often global journals and global health journals and even public health journals sit outside those local processes. And many instances they are outward looking, which is what I can describe as the problem of gaze. Um, uh, and so, for example, you, you find that a lot of what we are doing is uh, sort of learning from country X rather than learning within country X. So we think of the purpose of global health journals as to help us learn within as much as we are learning from, uh, th then we really have to step back a bit and ask ourselves, how, how might we make this infrastructure um, serve us better? Or how might we go about redesigning a completely new one if this current one um, uh, fails uh, to, to be able to be so modified. So, um, so what my new platforms look like? Um, again, if, you, if, we, if we take seriously the, the notion that, that what we are trying to do here is to stay consistent with the mission of global health, which is to reduce inequities um, anywhere it is found, and, and, the, and the purpose of knowledge platforms as being to connect systems more with themselves. We will, of course, pay less attention to the foreign gaze. Um, I will pay less, less attention to big journals like Lancet and the one that I edit, which is BMJ Global Health and the current BMJ itself, or the, or the New England Journal of Medicine, which, which when we think about them, especially the, the parent journals, they are in themselves local journals. They were set up to serve the local purposes of where they were set up. The BMJ was set up to serve that purpose in Britain, as, as Lancet was, as the New England Journal of Medicine was, for Massachusetts in the United States. So it's important to recognize that this, in fact, a, a lot of the, 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 the journals that loom large in, in the global imagination began and still are, um, in fact, functionally local journals serving specific, often local purposes. And this is not a, a charge of, uh, around national, nationalism, right? It is, it is an important point to make. That, that, that journals have a purpose, often their purpose is rooted geographically or in terms of a particular issue, and that that's perhaps the best way in which they, they may be constructed. Uh, and we then have to think clearly, of course, um, if we are thinking of, of what new platforms might look like. We need to ask ourselves, 
and it's, it's a long and important conversation to have with one's and with one's research teams and with one's colleagues and participants of field is what should we publish in global journals and what should we publish in journals that serve specific locally grounded purposes so that, that's one way of thinking about new platforms uh, it, it involves us thinking us about our attitudes to those platforms. How do we approach a global journal? How do we approach a local journal? What should it look like? What purposes should it serve? How should it be supported and, 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 and promoted to serve those purposes? And of course, it, it, for those who follow um, local conversations around, around health in different locations and, and those who follow the global conversations, if you, if you are in, in, in tune with those two kinds of conversations, you will realize that in many, many instances, like ships in the night, those two conversations are and, and this, I think, is, is an important uh, thing to think about if, when we're trying to reconstruct what um, a, a, a local uh, platform or a platform that serves to connect systems more with themselves might look like. Um, and also, as researchers, uh, uh, we would also have to ask ourselves, who is our primary audience? We are conducting a study in country X. Who is the audience of that study? Where is the theater of local influence in, in that setting? To whom are you trying to appeal? Who, to which gaze are you speaking to? And if we, if we, if we want to not be extractive or colonial, then our idea of our primary audience will be such that it is an audience um, to which, by speaking to it, we are connecting the system better with itself. Um, and of course, um, it, it would not necessarily be local academic journals. It could be other platforms. It could be radio. It could be blogs. It could be newspapers. It could be um, different form, uh, platforms. Again, we think very uh, uh, carefully, historically, again, about the, the ways in which um, people used knowledge, have used knowledge over time to solve local problems. Um, it, it, one of the things that strikes you is that the, the kinds of knowledge that we currently we share today on, on, on journals and, and global platforms, etc., didn't quite exist when some of the biggest improvements in health were made globally, um, especially in, in, in Europe and North America. These conversations we had on pa through pa pamphlet hearing, through, through local newspaper and radio, um, and, and in, in modern times, we even have much more effective mechanisms for, for sharing knowledge. Um, and we need, I think, when we're, if you're thinking about a, a, a new knowledge infrastructure for global health, we need to think much more broadly beyond journals. So there are other ways of connecting. We need to think historically as well. There are ways in which people have solved problems historically um, that require the kinds of organic change, the kinds of knowledge platforms that help drive organic change. And if we take those seriously, um, we would, of course, then need to look way, way beyond journals as currently constructed. Um, and we also, of course, then need to revalue re re or, or rethink how we value knowledge, right? I often struggle um, with when people conduct systematic views about a, a problem, say how to organize primary health care or how to, how to solve child undernutrition, et cetera. And they come saying, that uh, there's, there's very little in the literature, uh, so we, we don't know. And what, are, what often strikes me is that it is, it is you who does not, it is the literature that does not know. People know, uh, and, and people know, uh, and, and there's evidence that people know when you look on, in other kinds of places that go beyond what is available on PubMed. So local newspapers, blogs, radio programs, social media, even WhatsApp groups. And, and so the idea of knowledge and where it is to be found also needs to shift if we are going to better align our knowledge infrastructure with our mission to reduce inequities by solving organic problems and connecting systems better with ourselves. Um, and yeah, so we need to take very seriously the things that the literature does not know. Anyway, so hopefully what I've tried to do is, 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 is lay a bit of, of, of ground and, and an introduction to what I hope is going to be a very, very um, exciting uh, conversation. Um, uh, that would follow after the panelists um, give their their talks. At the end of the panelists' talk, uh, two two questions I think um, will will uh, will form the, the basis of of, of the conversations uh, going forward from there. Which is that if you were to start a new global health knowledge path, what would it look like, and how would it look? How would it work differently from what we currently have? Right. 
will you keep the current format or mechanism or modify it, modify it slightly? And of course, my answer to that is perhaps a bit clear, which is that there are aspects of the current format that we want to keep, but there are aspects that we want to modify quite significantly. And we may also need new platforms that sit side by side what we currently have as a current um, mechanism. Or, or will you begin from scratch and imagine a completely new model slash pattern? And yes, um, to, to my mind, um, um, for, for a certain kind of knowledge, and I think for organic kinds of knowledge that require sort of organic local processes, we need to reimagine a, a new model. So in a sense, there's tension between these two, and, and I'm sure that the panelists will have different views and opinions and ideas and, and strategies that we may um, adopt going forward as we rethink the ways in which we use knowledge, we generate knowledge, we share knowledge, we transfer knowledge, and we make knowledge uh, uh, consistent with our mission for equity and for connecting systems better with ourselves. Thank you very much, and I look forward to engaging, perhaps uh, seeing what people tweet about this session, and perhaps also uh, 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 following up with the panelists and with the chair um, uh, for how the session went. Thank you very much for joining us once again, and thanks to Jim and the other panelists for, for engaging and, 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 and for their work and their thoughts that I'm sure they will bring to this conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. Natalie, if you could convert back to the slides, I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Awesome, yeah, and so the next slide then. Uh, next one after this, great. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Abimbala has given us a lot to think about and our panelists are going to explore several different facets of the question, the general question that he has posed to us uh, from perspectives of various stakeholders, um, editors of journals, uh, producers and consumers of research. Um, so please keep that general question in mind. What do we want to preserve what do we want to get rid of in a new paradigm? And I think there are several different kinds of uh, concepts that uh, Dr. Abimbala has brought up that it's good to keep in mind. The surgical versus the organic, learning from within versus learning from. So we'll now move on to the next panelist. Um, and that is Dr. Peter Weiswa. Um, he is a senior researcher from McCary University and Karolinska Institute. You can read Dr. Weiss's full bio here on this slide, and he will review the landscape from the point of view of a producer and consumer of research and knowledge. Dr. Weiss. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the North-South Research Partnership in terms of knowledge production and dissemination. Next. Uh, and I'm going to be doing this based on my 12 years experience here at McKay University in Uganda about these partnerships. And one of the major questions that I ask all along is that whose agenda is it when this knowledge is generated and when it is being disseminated? And to do so, I want to talk about the context for the African academic. And I want to start by saying that yes, we have a lot of strengths. Many of us are, are quite well trained in uh, some of the best universities in Europe, in the US and in Africa. We have lots of relevant research opportunities and the areas to do research are quite many. In Africa, this is a setting where we have lots of vectors, pathogens, diseases, patients and communities. So there are so many opportunities. Please go back to the previous slide. And there are also lots of partnerships, especially with external organizations. And increasingly, there is increasing recognition uh, of the African scientists locally and internationally. And increasingly, there are lots of state-of-the-art hubs and the laboratories that are emerging across the continent. Next. But number one, we have issues. One of the issues that I wanted to highlight is capacity for research in our setting. Although we have a lot of burden uh, in Africa, in Uganda, we only have 2% two, um, two of the researchers in the world. 
Next. Also, the African scientists carry many uh, problems. There is a lot of burden on the scientists. We play so many informal roles, which many times we don't have enough time to do the research. We work in universities as teachers, we are innovators, we are providers of community services like medical care in hospitals. We are leaders in our organizations. We actually have a huge financial responsibility because of extended communities and lots of community norms. Just this week, I was burying a colleague. You have to attend some of these and you have to do too many jobs in order to make ends meet. All these puts a burden on the scientists. Next. Then number three, uh, we have low access to new knowledge uh, publications. For instance, what, what Sarah has talked about, uh, if you look at the Lancet Global, uh, in, terms of, uh, um, uh, in terms of access to new knowledge, uh, Africa contributed in this setting just about 1% of uh, uh, all the authors uh, in the Lancet Global Journals. Next. And also in terms of the corresponding authors for the Lancet Global, Africa almost was non-existent. Of course, we are beginning to emerge, but at the time of this publication, there were no African first authors uh, or in terms of corresponding authors. And also many times we are externally funded. Next. And um, next slide. We are externally funded and again, if you are externally funded, you have to ask the question, who sets this agenda? Whose agenda is it? For instance, here at McKay University, at uh, the School of Public Health where I work, the grant profile has improved. We we'll almost have $40 million a year. But almost 90% of these projects are funded from Europe and the US, with the Uganda contributing a small, a small part. Then you, uh, you see who is setting this agenda. There are so many problems with external funding. Next slide. There are so many problems with, with external funding. One, you respond to an RFA. Who set this agenda? Is it important uh, for us? Do they understand the context in which we are going to do the work? And lots of this work comes in small projects, or even large projects, but which never get institutionalized. And I call this pilotitis that uh, a lot of the projects are just pilots. Many of these projects are and and have no capacity building, or even the people who try to do capacity building, many times don't understand what capacity building should be in our context. In fact, I call Africa is like a large unregulated laboratory where everybody comes to do the experiment with very little control. And then the other problem we have is that many scientists struggle to become specialists in their fields, even after PhD because many times you move from field to field because you don't have consistent funding in your area of focus. Next. Then the other problem number five is there is a power imbalance with the global partners when we collaborate. I mean, they, they bring the money and the uh, funding through Western institutions uh, is, I mean, good, but uh, there are still many areas of problems. For instance, direct funding is quite rare. I mean, many times we are sub-grantees of a university in the US or an NGO in the US, often with very limited flexibility in these grants and too much control. You know, they control uh, a lot on what you can do and what you can't do. And uh, there is limited trust in us. And you know, in research, we need a lot of trust. Next. Then one of the other challenges that people have talked about that uh, sometimes uh, people uh, could behave as if they are data extractors. I mean, they come and get the data, they fly in and go out and they then make a publication. African scientists many times are like data collectors. I remember situations where we're collecting data and immediately we got into areas with internet. Uh, the data from our gadgets disappeared into the clouds. So there are now these clouds and you lose the data and you are just a data collector. Also in terms of authorship, we in our context many times we are absent from first authorship, from senior authorship, and many times if you are involved, you might just be in the middle. 
what some of the Roche paper to say lost in the middle. Then there's this problem of global mobility and the brain circulation. You know, um, in the global health, you have to travel, you have to engage, and maybe now with COVID, they are seeing a bit of that. But the process of getting visas, which we rarely discuss in global health, the process is too long, time wasting, and quite expensive. I remember the other day I was getting a long stay visa in the UK, and I had to pay almost a thousand pounds. There are too many needs, bring this certificate, bring a bank statement, bring a marriage certificate, bring a land title, uh, all those kinds of needs. And if you ever get a long stay visa, many times it is just a single entry, which is problematic. Next. But I just wanted to spend a little bit uh, some time on uh, this slide. Because we have some examples in Maki, we are very proud of the partnership we've done with the, the Swedes, with SIDA. This partnership is funding which was given to Maki so that Uganda can build the capacity to do research. And the, the focus was on building the capacity of the professors in Maki to be able to supervise. So they got PhD students who are basically junior uh, lecturers. And the, these professors were paired with professors with the universities in Sweden. And we work together to, to develop a research agenda which speaks to the country, speaks to the Minister of Health, speaks to the rest of government with the aim of that we shall become uh, centers of excellence and that will build uh, networks which will establish uh, where we shall be able to share intellectual and social capital and contribute to evidence-based uh, evidence making, but also policy making and this kind of partnership would be mutual. Through this, Makere has trained over, uh, Makere has trained over, over 300 uh, PhDs. Sorry, my, before I could not put on my video because I was not allowed. Uh, next. So we have a partnership that has worked for Makere. I think there are some areas where we can contribute in this collaboration between the South and the West. We need partnerships that are equitable, that are fair, that are transparent. We also need to support the development of local research agenda and make sure that when we have partnerships, they focus on what is a priority in the local context. We also need to think and act long-term and try to avoid these short-term projects. Of course, long-term is not always possible, but is desirable. We also need to look at capacity building in the broader sense, many capacity building efforts focus on individuals. When you focus on the individual, that individual is likely to leave the institution. So we recommend the partnership that build institutions, you train a PhD, but also you try to address some of the bottlenecks in these institutions. In terms of authorship, I want to say nothing from us without a prominent us. I think we, when research is collected from our setting, we need to be uh, prominently involved. And I would like to recommend that we develop a tool for measuring and guiding collaboration in order to enhance our accountability in these partnerships. But finally, I think governments are going to be important. Our, law, our governments, national governments have to come into our funding research collaborations. Next. And I wanted to end by uh, to say, has COVID made the difference? During COVID, many people from the West actually left our countries or they were repatriated. And now local scientists are the ones in charge and most of the funding is coming from local institutions. And the African governments are beginning to wake up and they're providing funding. For instance, here in Makere, the government has given us almost $10 million to do research on COVID, but also on other areas of research. And I think we need a new or post-COVID a uh, collaboration framework that is mutual and uh, uh, benefits both parties and builds local capacity. I thank you so much for listening to me. Great, thanks so much. Thanks very much, Dr. Weiswa. Um, again, a lot to think about and certainly we want to get into the question and answers later on about the post-COVID world or the current COVID world and how that might have changed the landscape. We wanna to move to the next panelist um, and she is Dr. Pranima Menon. 
Dr. Manon is a researcher from the International Food Policy Research Institute. You can read her full bio here on this slide that we have up now. Dr. Menon will explore the issue of identity of producers of knowledge. Many people don't have a single identity. Uh, this is a complex issue and she'll also explore hierarchies uh, based on other issues like gender and class. So Dr. Menon. Thank you so much, Jim. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be, um, to be in the session with all of you. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, I thought it would be useful to, uh, since we decided that I would speak a little bit to this issue of complex identities, to actually speak a little bit about my own complex identity and, and what I do. Uh, so I'm a nutrition researcher. Um, I'm an educator, not in, in an academic professorial way, but I spend a lot of time with policy audiences. Um, and I've been called uh, a factivist, which basically means I'm, you know, always uh, pushing for people to pay more attention to what the data says. My personal identity uh, is also complex. I was born in India, studied both in India and in the United States, uh, and came back to India uh, to work here in 2008, but with a global research organization. Um, I've worked in Haiti, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Ethiopia, and Vietnam. And so in many of these places, I have either been us or them, uh, depending on what I was working on and who I was with. I've spoken the language uh, in many of these countries um, and language is another aspect of identity that, that makes us feel sometimes more like us than them. Um, but um, what I have taken away from, from all of these at this point in time is that at a very fundamental level, most of us believe that knowledge is, is important and that um, the knowledge that we create and the knowledge that we take to, to people in spaces of making decisions um, is, is, is a powerful um, contributor to change. Uh, personally, I, I have been uncomfortable um, with what we've seen, of course, around um, you know, the prominence of Northern researchers who work on global health, um, and in many cases, the uh, somewhat the marginalization of Southern voices. Uh, but I also believe that we can and should be a little more nuanced about simple North, North South divides. Um, each of us is a drop in a drop of water, if you will, in the knowledge ecosystems, but together, everything we bring sort of becomes an ocean. And what we want is for us to move in the right directions to solve problems. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, uh, you can just click through so that we, we get the animations, great. All right, I thought it would be useful to say a little bit about the kind of work we do in India. Um, uh, I, I coordinate a program of work called POSHAN, which means nutrition in, in Hindi. Uh, but it stands for the acronym Partnerships and Opportunities for Strengthening and Harmonizing Actions on Nutrition in India. Um, and the work that we do involves research, it involves stakeholder engagement, and it involves uh, active policy support. Um, the kind of knowledge that we really try to bring together is, is evidence that focuses on the state of the nutrition challenge in India, what's known about the drivers of malnutrition. Uh, we look at at the solution space, so we try and understand the reach, the scale and quality of current solutions. And we're also uh, doing a lot of testing of new solutions. Uh, in all of this, our approach to, to kind of engaging in this knowledge ecosystem and creating a knowledge ecosystem as well, supporting one, is that the goal should be to, to have in any sort of policy ecosystem, the availability of high quality data and high quality evidence. Um, and also that the, the evidence producers in particular, both in what they do and in the dialogue that they create, uh, should ideally maintain a position of being data-driven and evidence-based and honest brokers, but also that those of us in the knowledge system need to be both opportunistic, proactive, and responsive. So these are principles that we've tried to bring to our work. And um, in all of this, it's not written on the slide, but perhaps the most important thing that we end up doing is connecting and convening people. Um, we, we've taken a very serious and mindful view um, of the idea that many drops of water make up that ocean of knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and one of the things that we have 
been doing as, as part of this is to be very explicit in recognizing that many voices exist at all levels, global, regional, national, and subnational, and that the best things that we can do are to sort of transparently and thoughtfully connect voices to create coherent and aligned narratives, uh, because that helps progress. Um, and the ways in which we've, we've tried to become explicit about it is that we've used tools uh, together with our local partners, um, together with, uh, with state governments and others to understand these knowledge ecosystems. So this is an example of a knowledge network map that we, um, that we developed in, in the state of Orissa in India. The pink dots there are all government entities, the yellow are development partners such as UNICEF and DFID and others. Uh, the green, the, the, the small blue ones are local uh, universities and knowledge producers. The green are civil society organizations. And what was really fascinating about this particular state is that the state government actually made it a point to bring in all these different voices when they had meetings about you know, what to do about problem X or problem Y or what to do about solution X or solution Y. And so this is why you see a lot of connections among these, these knowledge producers and, and, so, you know, and knowledge users. And I think this is the reality at any local um, in any local public health system, you have many producers of knowledge and many um, uh, sort of users of that knowledge. Um, and, and I think what we can do most productively is if both the producers and the users of the knowledge, knowledge sort of fully acknowledge this diversity of that landscape and does our very best to bring people together because this is then the only way in which we can connect some of that global generalizable knowledge to um, what's relevant and experiential in a local context. So in, in the program of work that we do, we've been trying to do this um, a lot and be explicit about it. Next slide. Now, one of the challenges with nutrition is that I think we're really far behind in our field. I've been you know, really sort of enjoying and keeping up with the discussions in global health around decolonizing and you know, especially um, reading sort of Say's work on, um, uh, on the gaze and things like that, but we are very far behind uh, behind that in, in sort of global public nutrition. Um, our agenda setting papers primarily are still dominated by Northern researchers or Southern origin researchers, but in, but in Northern institutions, national research voices who may sometimes criticize those are dismissed globally but then the local voices that are influential locally uh, often criticize some of these papers for sort of hidden agendas. But I think, you know, the fact that I have a complex identity of having lived and, and worked and studied in, you know, both Northern and Southern settings and, and my own work, which engages heavily both with local networks and with, within a global research institution, have just come to realize that at the end of the day, there's a reason that this, this discord sometimes may exist. Um, but the fact of the matter is that both Northern researchers and Southern researchers, if you can split it that way, really come from a place of care about using research to make lives better. Um, we are trying to make progress on nutrition by launching this movement called Standing Together for Nutrition. Um, and you know, I, we'll see where it goes, but we're trying to become very much more mindful about this. Uh, the last point I want to make before I, I close with some recommendations is that we should never forget that the Global South is not monolithic at all. It is deeply hierarchical, gendered, elitist, competitive, and those of us who um, you know, have begun work and careers in, in places and in institutions and in ecosystems, uh, knowledge ecosystems in the Global South have experienced all of that. So it's very rarely a North-South issue alone. We have to sort of account for all of the, the, um, the differences we see uh, in, in the Global South as well. We have to acknowledge that. And sometimes we don't, you know, we make it, we make the problem be about the Northern researchers, but there are lots of issues that need to be worked on in the Global South as well. Next slide. So I want to come back, you know, just to to close with saying that um, whether it's it's 
global north, global south, or whether it's uh, sort of research collaborations and creating knowledge ecosystems in just the global south. I think it's quite important that we, we operate and, and approach this with uh, A, the recognition that all of us care for that knowledge to be used for the public good. Um, and we need to think about what are the, the processes that actually create relevant and high quality research uh, in ways that make all of the voices heard, both within the global south and you know, between the, the north and the south. Um, in particular, I think northern researchers can lead um, they, by investing in building sort of deep personal knowledge of the researchers and the institutes in southern spaces. You know, often many people have not invested in, in getting to know people as scientists and as individuals. Um, I think we really need to take a step forward, step back kind of an approach. Uh, global health or global nutrition authors from high income countries could certainly ensure that for every paper they are an author on, they try to bring into that um, people that diversify the authorship and the perspectives that come into it. I think we have to commit to very real work together. Authorship cannot be tokenistic. Uh, we have to commit very deeply to equal roles throughout the research pipeline on research design, development, data collection, analysis, dissemination, both in global spaces and in local spaces. Um, and the gatekeepers around research can really, really help this. So donors who fund research, editors who hold the keys to disseminating research can do this. And national governments that should be funding a lot of research should absolutely be doing this. Um, in the end, I, you know, I just want to close by saying that I would never want to presume that either the northern researchers or the southern researchers aren't committed to this idea of knowledge for the public good. Why we work on certain problems comes from a place of care, from a place of wanting to solve problems for people who are less fortunate than us. Um, and I think we can do a lot if we really sort of approach this with the idea that each of us wants the same thing and that we can find common ground. Um, so let me stop there and then, you know, really look forward to the rest of the, the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Menon. Uh, again, really, really uh, important points here in terms of identity. It's not simply a North-South or a Northwest issue, um, but bringing up, first of all, the complexity of you know where someone even gets categorized in terms of their identity, as you point out, um, and are a great example in your own particular life. Um, and also the hierarchies within countries um, certainly play out. So thank you for bringing up these points and we'll explore them in more detail later on. I want to now introduce our last panelist. You can see Dr. Stephen Hodgins, his bio is up now. Steve is the editor in chief of Global Health Science and Practice. Um, he will review the landscape from the point of view of a journal editor that is a curator of research and knowledge. Um, so Steve. Yeah, thanks Jim. Um, I'm. I, I count myself really privileged to be on the panel together with uh, with my colleagues. Uh, I've been, as I'll be mentioning further along, uh, I've been learning from them. Um, so as, as Jim mentioned, I'm going to be giving a, a perspective from uh, a global health journal addressing these questions of uh, perspective or, or gaze and uh, voice or representation. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that um, kind of what we've been doing at Global Health Science is a, an exemplary case. I, I mean, we've, uh, like everybody, uh, undoubtedly, we're, we're still wearing blinders uh, that prevent us from fully understanding these issues. Uh, but we're, um, you, know, you know, trying uh, in good faith to uh, engage these issues. And I'll, I'll just explain uh, over the next uh, couple of minutes uh, kind of how that's been uh, going. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, give you a little bit of background on, on the Global Health Science and Practice Journal. Uh, so our, our journal has uh, been running now for seven years. The, the driving force behind the creation of the journal was uh, Jim Shelton, uh, who for many years was a senior scientist at uh, USAID. Uh, and he had a, a, a vision uh, for, you know, for this journal for, you know, for, for a number of years before 
uh, it got started. Uh, and what he wanted to see was uh, a journal that would serve as a platform that would in effect do uh, both of the, uh, well, address both of the kinds of uh, change and evidence that uh, my colleague Shai talked about uh, at the beginning, the surgical and the organic. So um, the idea was to, um, uh, to help ground program work in sound evidence on the one hand, kind of the surgical piece, and then at the same time to generate evidence, insights, and learning relevant to policy programs and practice. So this is again the uh, to to Shay's uh, um, uh, metaphor that uh, you know the organic rather than the surgical. Um, you can go back to the previous slide. Or okay, yeah, next next slide is fine. Um, so. Um, now, part of our the model for our journal uh, uh, is that uh, this is like our funding uh, comes uh, from USAID, and because of the grant that we uh, you know that funds our work, uh, we're able to um, make all of the content available free access online without charging a fee uh, to the authors, and that's it's it's great being in a position to be able to do that. Now, that having been said, wherever the funding comes from. For a journal that that has you know some consequence now uh usaid kind of manages this with, on the basis of an arm's distance uh relationship so we're given uh, full editorial uh, independence but at, at the same time uh we we do depend on usaid for our funding uh the i'll talk now uh, kind of about these issues again of gaze and representation uh, over the last uh, year or two uh, the editorial leadership at, at, at our journal has increasingly recognized and become dissatisfied with uh, on the one hand that the, the, well dissatisfied with an imbalance between on the one hand the geographic focus of our journal which is low and middle income countries and on the other the composition of authors reviewers core editors and editorial board with regard to place of residence, nationality, and gender. Uh, last year, um, a, little, a little over a year ago, uh, we were kind of challenged on this and kind of helped to, uh, to, to think more clearly by uh, a, a paper that was published in, in BMJ Global Health by Nafad um, and an accompanying uh, editorial uh, by my fellow panelist, uh, uh, Shay. Uh, on, on, on these issues of, of, of gaze and representation. And this uh, uh, kind of challenged us to kind of look um, a little bit more self-critically about uh, how we operate. So our journal was one of the journals that was uh, kind of included in this analysis by Nafad. And uh, as was documented there, although among our core journal editors and our editorial board members, there was reasonable distribution, uh, reasonably equitable distribution by gender. Um, of, the, of the 30 members of uh, the editorial board and the core journal editors, there were only six that were based in low and middle income countries. And that situation hasn't changed very much since then. Among the eight members of our core editorial group, although half are women, only one is a citizen of a low and middle income country and, and, and uh, he's currently residing in the US. Among the 14 members of our editorial board, five are women and five are resident in and, and citizens of low and middle income countries. Uh, so although we haven't yet systematically tracked the distribution uh, at the level of authors and peer reviewers, our impression is that uh, although the, the, the imbalance is not quite as stark as it is for, for our editors, that voices and perspectives from those working in low and middle income countries are not as well represented uh, in what we publish as they should be. Now, uh, I'll take the next couple of minutes to talk about some of the things that we've been doing to try to uh, remedy this uh, imbalance. We recently published a statement of our intentions um, in, in our Septem the September issue of our, uh, of our journal. And as explained in that editorial, um, we're taking a number of steps um, 
First of all, with regard to our core editorial group, as I mentioned, we have uh, eight members. And so we're now kind of actively reaching out and, and uh, we're expecting in the coming months to add one or possibly two uh, new members of the, of the, of the, the core editorial group. And we're, we're seeking those uh, new members uh, from uh, you know, colleagues based in low and middle income countries. Uh, we're also uh, committed to ensuring that, the, that perspectives from authors based in low and middle income countries are evident in the articles, in the articles we publish. Uh, to the point made uh, kind of earlier by Peter, uh, nothing done, or nothing from us uh, without a prominent us. <laughs> so if we've got pieces of work that are coming out of uh, specific countries, uh, kind of absolutely there needs to be a, a prominent kind of a perspective there from kind of actors on the on the ground, and that needs to be reflected uh, in uh, in authorship. And so, uh, kind of recognizing this as a as an area that we where we needed action, we've made changes to our policies and procedures and instructions to authors. So, uh, whenever we get papers uh, reporting on work in uh, in, in a particular country, there's now clearly expressed expectation that um, uh, that there should be uh, kind of authors from in country, and and if that's not the case, then in the cover letter accompanying those manuscripts, it needs to be explained why. And uh, now it's our practice if we get such papers and there aren't in country authors that we follow up with the corresponding author, uh, you know, to address that issue. And and to Pranima's uh, point too, it's not we don't want um, uh, just tokenism with regard to, to authorship. I mean, it, it, it's important that that uh, that that uh, whatever submissions we we retain that they uh, that they reflect perspectives of uh, in-country researchers, in-country program people, policy people, and that that significant contribution to those papers should be reflected in the prominence of of, of authorship. Um, Another point which we've um, kind of further clarified in, in recent changes in our policies and, and instructions to authors, but this has been a, a principle that's, that we've had from the beginning, is we expect that uh, any individuals or institutions from high income countries that are implementing programs or conducting research in low and middle income countries will respectfully and substantively engage stakeholders from those countries in decision making, planning, implementation, and research. Um, and again, that 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 needs to be reflected in the papers we we receive, and we've um, made that explicit now in our guidance online. Um, finally, uh, we remain committed to trying to remove publication barriers that can disproportionately impact authors. Uh, that are based in low and middle income countries. And as, as I mentioned from the beginning, one of the things that's a, a, a kind of a blessing for us is that under our, our, our funding model, we're able to, uh, to offer free online access without, uh, without fees. So that removes one important barrier. Another issue is, is we, have, we have authors that have got uh, kind of important things to say, but um, uh, who, who may have Kind of language issues, or who may not have had very much experience in writing for the, the global peer-reviewed uh, literature. So we, in in a, in a variety in a variety of ways, we're uh, we like we seek to offer additional support to uh, you know to authors so that they can get manuscripts that are uh, kind of up to standard for uh, for publication. Now we acknowledge that these are small, uh, limited steps and by themselves they're um, you know they're not going to kind of revolutionize things in in the way that uh, uh, Shay was uh, you know talking about in his presentation but um, we are certainly encouraged that, that that these issues are now getting much more prominent uh, attention um, uh, at global health science and practice we've been engaged in discussions uh, with uh, you know the people who've been on the panel today and and others and we've been learning a lot from them and and today in our session again I've been learning more from uh, you know from my fellow panelists and I'm really looking forward to the discussion coming up and and we're very open to input suggestions criticisms uh, you know so that we can uh, be playing a, a constructive part moving forward thank you Thanks so much, Steve. So again, lots to think about. Let's move to the
questions. I'm going to start. We have we're getting plenty of questions um, from our participants, and I would encourage people to continue to put your questions or comments into um, the Q and A. Uh, box. So really appreciate that. And we'll certainly try to get to many, as many of these as we can. Um, but I do want to start, you know, with a, a general one. And I want to remind us again, I think, Natalie, the next slide, we, we have this uh, question. So I'm going to start with the general question that uh, Dr. Bimbala has um, applied to us or posed to us. And with a little bit just a little bit more um, specificity, say, um, uh, kind of maybe I want to uh, hear what everyone thinks about this. So again, um, just want to think about is knowledge dissemination, the knowledge dissemination paradigms, paradigm so broken that we should start over or can it be fixed incrementally? Um, and if you propose to change a particular parameter or throw it out entirely, then please consider what would the new parameter or paradigm actually look like? And what problem are you trying to solve, you know, with your, you know, intended or proposed solution? And um, I want you also to think about as you pose that, what would the possible unintended consequences of your proposed change be? And uh, in particular, one I, I kind of thought about myself um, as we've uh, proposed this idea of looking at blogs and other very creative ways of thinking about disseminating knowledge, analyzing knowledge, distilling knowledge <clears throat> and getting the local voice is there is a certain kind of uh, function that's been played by global journals. Now it might be very much biased, skewed, but there is kind of a shortcut that we have from global journals that are you know, prestigious like the, the Lancet and others. And uh, they allow us to kind of think, well, if it clears there, then I, you know, we must be true, so to speak. Of course, I know we're all scientists and we go deeper than that, but there is a certain level of heft there, you know. And so again, when you think about this unintended consequences of the pro proposed solution, maybe this is one thing to be thinking about. So I'm going to just, you know, propose, you know, pose this question and maybe we can go in order um, of the panelists as they um, have presented to us before. So I can um, open it to, uh, to Peter first, you know, to kind of address uh, these questions and uh, we'll go around in order before getting to um, some of the questions that we got from our participants. Uh, thank you so much. I actually hope you heard me because I had children in my neighborhood I come and almost listen. Uh, but uh, coming back to these questions that uh, say us, I think we cannot just dismantle <laughs> what is existing because um, then we will have nowhere to start from. I think there is a lot to learn from uh, the current knowledge generation system and knowledge dissemination. And uh, But I think uh, most critically, um, I think we have an inverted relationship whereby uh, in our setting, everything is too weak. And uh, until there is some kind of solidarity, I think it's going to be difficult for us even to try to compete. Um, many times in our setting, we are doing the role of, of uh, being the source of the research or the, uh, the project, but not at the time of the dissemination. And unfortunately, the way ranking happens uh, we are doing the same uh, about the type of paper you, you do. So I think to take global solidarity and uh, a little bit of more reflection from the global partners and uh, journals on how we can reverse this. Uh, but I think, and also I don't think it will just happen. Uh, we have to demand for it from our settings. And as I said, our governments have to invest. Uh, we perhaps also need regional journals uh, that talk uh, about uh, the local context and things that are relevant. But then the challenge will be how will be the ranking because uh, ranking is based on how much impact you are making, uh, which journal have you published in, and, and those kind of things remain the challenge. So and, until we change 
Uh, the other day I was thinking about, oh, I have done a lot of research that has influenced policy here, but it cannot even be judged or nobody even knows about it. Uh, so I think we need to change a lot of things in the way we disseminate and also disseminate research, but also the way we uh, rank uh, the quality of what you are disseminating and the, what types of dissemination is important. So recently I, I just told my colleagues that if your research doesn't have uh, either policy or, or pro program impact, then it is very difficult to say that your research was important, even if it was uh, uh, quite referenced. So th those are some of the considerations that I would uh, like to make. In order to build this capacity here locally, uh, a lot of investment is needed. First of all, the language of dissemination is mainly English. And uh, even if I'm speaking it now, I remain um, like uh, it remains foreign to me and foreign to many people. So I think there are so lots of things that we need to look at in order to change the status quo. But we cannot just dismantle the current paradigm and uh, uh, we need to build on it. Uh, but I think there's a lot of urgency to do so. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. Really appreciate those thoughts. Um, and we'll get you know into more depth uh, later because we're getting a lot of really great questions from um, our participants. But I do want to uh, at the moment now move on to um, Dr. Menon. Um, any uh, thoughts on these initial questions? Over to you. Um, yeah, thanks, Jim. So I, you know, I, I think the the I, I wrote down in my notebook in quotes, what do we mean by the dissemination paradigm, the knowledge dissemination paradigm? Um, and if we mean global health journals or public health journals, then you know I, I I think the answer you know I agree with Peter. It's not to to discard uh, the publication of research or relevant research in these in these journals, uh, but I think it's to think about how we make that better, how we make those make that more inclusive, how we um, you know publish the things that matter today, but. For me, public health and global health journals, they're also a way of preserving science for the future. And, and the thing with knowledge is you never know when you're going to need it. You know, just because a paper is published today does not mean that a government only needs that information today. Uh, I've been, you know, in this sort of knowledge broker kind of a position or a job um, as part of this project that we run in India for 10 years now. And, you know, even today, there's things that I will share with people that were published sometimes 10 years ago, 15 years ago to say, listen, we have talked about these issues before. This is where it's published. Here is a piece of work that you should take a look at. And so, so I think we need that, you know, we absolutely need to preserve knowledge that is generated because it's useful, not just to us in this context, but so much of what is done, for example, you know, when you study the health extension program in Ethiopia or the ASHA program in India, um, that knowledge is, is generalizable. It's important to, to put that out there and for people who are thinking about large scale community-based programs, health programs in other countries to, to look at these and learn from them and, and think about how to make their programs better, right? So I think academic journals have a critically important job in terms of preserving knowledge and sort of uh, being a legacy repository almost for knowledge. Uh, but paradigms of how knowledge is used, I think the knowledge for public good is where I think we can do, um, we can really think a lot about, you know, we have, there are many different initiatives, ours is, you know, just one of many where people have been learning about this. You know, what does it take to support decision-making ecosystems with scientific knowledge uh, and to integrate that with other forms of knowledge, you know, with program experience, with uh, local context of other kinds, you know, not just program experience, but, um, and, and, you know, so, so for me, I think that there's, there's that. Uh, I think we must approach the question of what, what are the processes through which knowledge is published in uh, academic journals? And how do you make sure that, you know, the, the local voice 
uh, and gaze and everything is, you know, is also preserved there. If it's a paper, you know, that's about a health system in Africa um, in, or in, you know, in Ethiopia or in a state in India, then it makes sense that we have people who know those systems and can reflect on and help us, help the researchers interpret those findings. Um, so that, it, it was really great to hear what Steve was saying, you know, the kind of lenses that they're bringing in, in the journal. And I think all journal editors should be doing that, you know, and not just in health. So much that relates to health is published in economics journals, is published in other social science journals. And if we think public health journals have a problem, we haven't yet seen the problems in some of these other fields where they don't like even more than two authors and three authors on a paper, for example, in economics. It's, you know, there, there are long ways to go in all of these, but I really do think that editors uh, who are the gatekeepers here can play a huge, huge role and ask tough questions if needed um, of, of uh, the authors. But I, I don't think we're ready to dismantle journals. I don't know where I would go to find something if I wanted it 20 years from now, if it were not published in an academic journal. That's all. Great, thanks so much. I really appreciate those additional thoughts. And Steve, as you uh, are um, I'm, we're moving on to you. I just want you to, uh, you know, address these. And in particular, there's one question I think is quite germane already from the audience. So I want to kind of maybe you could uh, wrap that into your response. It's uh, how exactly are you as journal editor engaging with these high income country authors uh, that maybe uh, have not taken into account you know, voice and gaze from uh, authors from from uh, in country. So maybe consider that in your answer too. So over to you, Steve. Okay, maybe I'll just, while it's fresh in my mind, I'll, I'll respond to that last question first. Um, this is something, I guess it's kind of been kind of niggling at us for, for a while, but it's only very recently that we're approaching this in a more intentional way. So we did change the language in our, in our, uh, in, uh, with, for our policy, uh, like on our website with instructions to authors. We, uh, we have only just begun now kind of following up with, with authors uh, where there's a, I would say a problematic author list, like where we've got a, 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 a paper reporting on uh, kind of research or program work in country, like with, with, with minimal or no um, perspective from in-country authors. So, uh, so what we're doing now is we're going to the um, to the correspond going back to the corresponding author. Like before, we make a decision to move a paper to peer review, and we're raising this issue with them, and we're saying. I mean, again, it depends on the paper, it depends on what the issue is, but generally it, it, it's, um, you know, we feel that the perspective from in-country in -country actors is not adequately reflected. Can you address this? Um, and, um, and, and, you know, like if so, then that should be reflected in, in, in the authorship. So again, this is, this is very early days. Like we've, we've made a, a kind of a policy decision to do this some months ago. We've kind of formalized that just recently, like at the, at the time of uh, the, our last issue went out and then only for the first time now, are, are we beginning, uh, with, with a few of the manuscripts that we've received, uh, you know, to reach out to those, uh, corresponding authors, um, to, to the, I guess, to this, to the question that, Shay raised at the beginning about kind of what 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 do we need to do now? Do we need to kind of dismantle the current system? Do we need something completely new, or are, like are there ways of uh, kind of fixing uh, the platform? I I, I would echo uh, comments made by uh, the other two panelists that um, I, I think there is an important role to be played by uh, like global peer review journals. Uh, I think we need to improve how we work, and at the same time, I think there is a, a need for uh, for new platforms, uh, uh, you know, Peter mentioned that uh, um, you know, more kind of good, robust uh, regional journals have a you know a, a potentially an important role to play, but also beyond peer review. Uh, with knowledge management, I mean, roughly we've got the two sides: we've got knowledge production and we've got knowledge use. And uh, at, at the end of the day, if we want to see um, uh, better population level outcomes. We, you know, we want we want to see really effective use of of, of knowledge. Um, so I think specifically on the on the peer review journal side, and to, to echo a point made by Pranima, I think there, there there really is value in having certain forms of 
kind of knowledge and evidence that are kind of posted more definitively and available on the record kind of long term. So indexed peer review, uh, peer reviewed journal articles that kind of will remain accessible, um, you know, the kind of on the record. I mean, that's different. Uh, that's different from a blog or, or or some of these other kind of forms of of exchange, which can be really ephemeral. At the same time, um, I, I, I I think there's there's much more needed in a in a healthy knowledge ecosystem than what peer review journals alone can do. So so again, I I, I think there's certainly a place uh, beyond just kind of improving and kind of making tweaks to the peer review journal system. I, you know, I think we need to be developing other platforms to facilitate kind of exchange of knowledge. Thanks so much. I really appreciate this. And uh, now we can kind of start to launch into some of the questions we're getting from the chat um, from our various participants. Um, I think we've, you know, set the stage and then there's uh, so many here. We're going to try as much as possible to get to as many of these as we can. Um, I want to really launch into one that I think pulls together several different strains that we've gotten from people in the chat. And I want to uh, just pose this to all of you. All of, all of our, all of you as panelists are senior researchers. You've been around for a while. You have a lot of credibility. Um, you have the ability to kind of uh, really kind of uh, maybe shape the agenda in ways that young researchers might not. There's the publisher parish kind of incentive structure, you know, for young researchers. Um, and uh, th this, this is kind of wrapped up with some other questions that we're getting here. Will change come from the North or the South or the West or what have you? Um, or is it really, is there, is there power enough, you know, for local researchers to kind of really push forward? And what does credibility look like, you know, if we're publishing in other kinds of places? So this kind of young or more junior researcher question, um, just want to pose that to you all. Um, and, you know, uh, whoever wants to take that one first and be brave, <laughs> go right ahead. Uh, let me let me take a crack at that. Um, so, I, you know, I think this is really it is really tricky because I it, it depends on the uh, the incentive for researchers to publish in peer reviewed journals is not going away for a very long time. I think the question for junior researchers is what kind of institution are you in? And you know, what are the incentive structures of those institutions and can some of those be, be managed? Um, at, at our institution, for example, we, uh, you know, we, we have a system, we, our incentive system is it's simply to say we expect at least two peer reviewed publications per researcher per year. Now, if you work in global health, many people are publishing a lot more than that, but we also have a lot of economists whose papers can take three years to come out in public domain. So two is a number that works very well for the mix of researchers at our institution. Um, and we've also agreed that there's no within institution competition. So it doesn't matter if you're first author or 15th author on a paper, it's going to be valued the same on your internal incentive systems. Um, so I think researchers and junior researchers should understand their own ambitions uh, and in both in terms of internal progress in their own research institutions and, you know, I think external ambitions and, you know, work with, work with your mentors who can help you find the ways or, you know, find a path that helps you meet both the internal and the external ambitions. Um, if, if senior authors and, and research mentors are not having those conversations with junior researchers in our institutions, we are not serving junior researchers well. If we don't help junior researchers move on the paths that are important for them. So I take that quite seriously as a manager because people have taken it very seriously with, with me. Um, but I think you know this is where these issues of within the global south hierarchies and issues come up. Um, they, we have to be able to confront that. Senior authors or senior researchers in the global south are as guilty of not allowing junior colleagues or not supporting junior colleagues to progress as, as in any other setting. Um, so I think this is, you know, the, this is a challenge. The, the question on, you know, journals versus other pieces of research, again, can be organized if we understand what some of those internal and external metrics are that make sense. 
and also what you're producing the knowledge for. You know, not everything you do needs to be a journal article. Uh, in, in our program of work, we publish many, many things that are just data sheets for uh, policy audiences that are, you know, infographics and other such things. And then, you know, the journal articles, we preserve certain other pieces of our research for journal articles. Um, but I really, you know, I, I think we have to encourage uh, and senior researchers in global health institutions or public health institutions around the world to really work with uh, with junior research colleagues to mentor and support those journeys and to make the in internal and external incentives really um, clear and transparent and yeah I, I mean I'd be really interested to hear Peter what you know how you organize that uh, where you're based but uh, there have to be more of these not just conversations but actions you know helping helping junior researchers very actively through this. Over. Yeah, um, I think I like to agree with more <clears throat> with Ponima what she said. Um, just to give you a situation. A couple of months ago, uh, colleagues of mine organized um, a session on how to uh, do your PhD and get a uh, graduate uh, in Macquarie University. And uh, the room we were in uh, filled up. So we're all surprised that there's so much interest in people doing a PhD and we're listening. So there is um, a lot of interest out there. Uh, at that time, I think there were over a hundred people coming into the room uh, to listen. Um, but actually the landscape is, is changing. You know, um, many years ago, everybody wanted to go to Europe or the US to do a PhD, <laughs> but it has become impossible because uh, those opportunities are gone a few uh, or because the PhDs have become very expensive. Uh, right now at ECMAK, we have a homegrown PhD and uh, uh, we've copied from others, uh, which is a PhD by publication. So people are doing as much publication as, um, as, um, uh, as uh, elsewhere, and, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but the process, I think I agree with her that it's quite difficult. Uh, one, it's so dependent on the institution. <laughs> Um, if it has an active process for promoting uh, junior researchers. Unfortunately, I'm quite frustrated by the system because um, uh, this um, uh, research is interesting. I think it's one of the areas where people <laughs> actually never retire. <laughs> so you find people who are doing research 40, 50 years ago are still competing for grants and actually getting most of the large grants. And what happens is so much dependent on the actions of those senior uh, colleagues. So their ability to do mentorship and the interest young people is important. But also, um, the, I think the, the and funny, the most of the funding is coming from the West. <clears throat> um, I think I don't know many opportunities where people are being funded, even for a local PhD by local money. <laughs> uh, those are few opportunities. Many times you embedded in the project is funded from the West or there is actually funding from a certain embassy. So how do we design projects, for instance, so that they embed the capacity building? I think this is quite important. I always say um, people talk, oh, we want to develop Africa or Asia and stuff. And I usually say, you cannot develop it without local experts. There is not going to be a place where people will fly in and solve local problems. If it was possible, all our problems would be gone <laughs> because people have been flying in. But what we need is this local expertise and to build a quick commerce. So the, the countries, the local institutions are going to be important. But before that happens, I think the junior researcher uh, has to be committed, has to be uh, resilient, has to be to look out for people who are helpful, who can mentor, and, uh, um, and, and also to, to start small, <laughs> maybe by attending a conference, writing an abstract, writing a paper, in the, not in the Lancet maybe, <laughs> uh, but maybe in a, a local journal. <clears throat> and, and then all these um, um, uh, writing clubs and the getting uh, mentorship. One of the things that uh, I've, I, I picked interest in, like uh, actually the PhD portfolio in Mackay has grown so much that uh, and the, one of the drivers has been, we have a PhD forum peer, just peer group. 
And uh, these guys were doing PhD meet together and actual, actual critique work. By the time that work is presented to like the senior panels, uh, they, they are virtually, uh, most of the issues have been sorted out. So I think there's a, a lot of um, role for commentorship, but also mentorship, uh, what I call vertical mentorship uh, from more senior people. Uh, those, that is what I would say for junior uh, researchers that uh, for now, as opportunities begin to be created, they need to be creative, but also to look out for opportunities and for people who are a bit more positive uh, to mentoring as they wait for institutions to become more responsive. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Any thoughts on this? Uh, I don't have much more to add. I mean, at Global Health Science and Practice, uh, uh, one, I guess, small way that we try to contribute in this area is uh, when we get a, a paper uh, you know, from a, a, an in-country author or author group that seems promising but is not close to being ready for uh, publication, we do look for opportunities um, to pair somebody up with that group uh, to work with them. Like, like in, a, in a kind of a mentoring uh, relationship. So we, we've had a number of papers like that that have ultimately got to, to publication uh, kind of through a, a mentoring process that we've helped to facilitate. Thanks so much. Okay, well, I'm gonna move on to another question. And really, again, I'm gonna to try to kind of group of several questions together that I'm seeing from the chat. And thanks so much again to our participants who are being really active and really pushing us here. Okay, so this is about incentive structures um, and also business models, I might say. Um, uh, for researchers, there's an incentive in some places to really have single or sole authorship, which obviously makes it really difficult, you know, to kind of um, have some sort of balance. Um, and uh, business, uh, journals also, you know, charge publication fees and uh, ironically, Local journals, uh, one of our uh, questioners said, they, in their experience, are even more likely than, um, than global journals to not waive fees uh, for an LMIC re researcher from a low and middle income country. So what do we do about this? Um, so I uh, just wanted to, you know, kind of uh, put that out there. Uh, one. One last thing, and I don't know if we, I'm not complicating it too much, <laughs> but if anybody wants to consider this as well, someone has also, uh, in terms of just generally the way we do things, someone else has posed uh, this question too. What about post peer review publication? We just put everything out there. You know, we, we get the peer reviews afterwards. You know, Gates has done this sort of model. Others are looking at this sort of thing. So something about incentives business models, the peer review process, you know, pick any, any one of you can pick any one of those uh, three issues or all of them. So again, um, whoever wants to go first, go right ahead. I vote for Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I could I could respond to it on a couple of those. Um, I mean, as far as single authorship is concerned, I in in most journals that are publishing in global health, as far as the journals are concerned, that's 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 not an issue. I mean, I, I, Pranima was mentioning in in the economics field, it's a little bit different. Um, I, I, in most academic institutions in public health and health sciences, again, I think there's there's a it's very common that you've got multiple authors. So I guess it depends on the specific field that you're, that you're working in, like, like to what extent that's an issue. I mean, I think it's a problem, like if you're working within a system where sole authorship is incentivized. I mean, inherently, like with, with, with public health enterprises and public health research, these are almost always collaborative. Like, you know, so you've got, you, you know, you do at the end of the day have multiple people involved and, and that should be reflected in, in, in uh, authorship. Uh, I mean, on business models, um, I mean, I mentioned that with Global Health Science and Practice, we're in a position a bit like a few other journals, like for example, the Bulletin of the, of the World Health Organization, where we've got institutional funding that allows us to make our material available free access online without charging fees. Um, I mean, that's a luxury that most journals don't have. Like the, the reality is that it, 
takes some significant resources to publish uh, journals, and there's a significant level of effort that goes into every article. Um, and, and one way or the other, I mean, those resources have to be marshaled and, and, and it may be, for example, on the part of uh, peer reviewers that they're not getting any financial compensation for it. Um, but, but, but one way or the other, there are real costs associated with, 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 with maintaining and you know, active platforms like this and so, so that they have to be funded somehow. I, I, I think we do have to find, we, we, we have to be creative, we have to recognize who's being excluded by current arrangements and, and, and how can that be remedied? So uh, I, I think uh, in principle, regional journals or local journals could be playing a very important role. Like there is very important knowledge and learning that's coming out of local systems. It isn't necessarily relevant for the global literature, but it can be highly relevant for local and regional uh, audiences. And so we do need to make sure that the that people who could be participating, who could be contributing, are not being um, prevented from doing so because of uh, because of fees. I mean, certainly that like the traditional ways that fees get covered is you've got a research grant and you can include that as a line item in your in your grant. Or if you're or if you're doing work with a donor funded project, I mean, the, the project has funds that can be used to pay publication fees. But under other circumstances, you can be doing important and useful work, but you don't have a budget line item you can draw on. So again, this is a problem and we need to find remedies. I'm going to take my prerogative as uh, the um, facilitator here and ask one quick follow-up question. I hope it's quick. Steve, um, someone also asked, are, do you have any statistics, and maybe Natalie might have this as well, um, do you have any statistics on um, acceptance rates um, by geography, gender, et cetera, so that we can, you know, is there a differ, uh, differential here or, you know, what, is, what do things look like? We haven't. I, I, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, Natalie could correct me, but I, I don't think we've done that kind of calculation yet, but it, it, it would be worthwhile for us to do. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can confirm that we Maybe haven't done that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Peter, go ahead. So we'll, we'll see if we can follow up on that uh, at some point in the future. So stay tuned. Uh, may not be able to answer that here and now, but, uh, you know, um, maybe later on. So yeah, Peter, you were going saying, go ahead. I was... Um, uh, an editor to the International Journal of Public Health, and uh, it, it, one of the in the, in one of the meetings we had, one of the concern was we are having extremely low acceptance levels for uh, submissions from from Africa. I'm sure um, other editors have those issues. So there, there was a lot of desk uh, top rejections of. Um, submissions because of several things like uh, I think issues of people for even guidelines, language, quality and stuff. So I think it remains uh, a big problem because these areas are not well developed in terms of a capacity building. Uh, then my question, my comments on single versus multiple, I think are the same as what Steve said. Um, I, I think it's a big problem to have a single uh, author because uh, I think many authors, if they are really good, they always bring an important contribution to the quality of a manuscript. And then this uh, pre, uh, pre publication that are coming out increasingly, um, and including the Gates Foundation, which I, 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 I often receive, I think they're interesting. And during this COVID, many journals are doing that. but. Uh, uh, many of them come with a lot of problems, and and I think the process of peer review uh, contributes a lot to the quality of a manuscript. But some people may not actually fold up the paper and read it; may go with the mistake which was the, in the in the paper they read the first time. And uh, uh, if it has implications to, like the way to give medicine or to make important clinical decision, then it is quite problematic. Yet on the other hand. Uh, you want research to be accessible because some journals really take a very long time. You have a manuscript and you've been you've been waiting for six months to a year. That is also uh, quite painful. So uh, we need to find a balance. And as Steve says, I think there is an important role for the journals, but that takes a lot of um, uh, resources to make sure that they look at the quality of 
the submissions. I'm quite aware that many journals receive thousands, yet they publish just uh, uh, maybe even less than 10% of what they get. <laughs> uh, talk about like the Lancet and journals like those. So how do you manage that process to make sure that everything is well reviewed before you put it out there? So the area remains challenging. It is an important step, but uh, I think it is still with many problems. We need to build the capacity of those people who are submitting to make sure that there's a, a process to ensure that there's a, a quality uh, submission that you make available before peer review. Uh, so Jim, a, a couple of reflections from my end. I, I think it's the conversation on pre-publication um, versions is very interesting to me. So again, you know, I work in an organization that has many, um, uh, actually economists are the, the base that IFPRI is primarily uh, economists. And, you know, we've been learning from each other, those of us who are more in the public health uh, side of things and, and them as to the kinds of things that we like and don't like in each other's publication worlds, if you will. So the idea of pre-publication is very common in economics. I mean, most economists have their own websites. Uh, they just post their papers on their websites. They continually revise them. They keep getting feedback. They keep revising them. You know, eventually it'll come out in some journal somewhere, but multiple versions of their paper based on, you know, seminars they've given, et cetera, keep coming up on, you know, on their websites. We rarely do that in public health. You know, in our institution, the nutritionists and health folks don't publish working papers. We, we, you know, we have an internal working paper sy system at IFPRI, we have discussion papers, but we rarely submit to our internal series. They're available in public domain because you know, we don't wanna hurt our journal publication uh, prospects. But I, I think this idea is, is, it's a very useful one. It's really important. And you know, we should all be looking at, um, ways of putting knowledge out quickly, but with, with enough caveats that people understand that, okay, this is something that has not gone through peer review. And that requires not educating ourselves, but actually working with the knowledge users, working with the media. Um, I had a fascinating encounter with a journalist today who shared a pre-publication version of a paper with me. And she asked me, she said, do you think their conclusions are appropriate for the methods they used. And I was like, what, are you a journalist? Or, you know, who are you? I just found that so amazing. Uh, but I think there's mediums like Twitter in a sense have also connected so many of us, uh, you know, and followed by journalists or, you know, we interact with policymakers. It's all happening in a common space. And that has changed very quickly how people view and see, um, see things. The other thing about you know, the health and economics thing in our institution, which I find, find really interesting is the issue of the number of authors. So you know, there again, we've learned from each other and we now have an institute that is you know, primarily um, you know, economics or economics researchers oriented who taken very generously the spirit from the public health world that it's okay if you have multiple authors and not only is it okay if you do that, we're not gonna count who's first, second or third in how we incentivize or use that publication internally for performance tracking and other such things. So I think institutions hold a lot of power. Um, the problem is when you have these cross institutional collaborations and the two institutions from which the researchers are collaborating have very different standards for how this is done. You know, so if my collaborator is an institution where they definitely need first author or second author you know, but I've actually done most of the work, then, you know, that, that becomes tricky, right? But I, I think for me, the number one principle in collaborative research is you talk about publications the day you start talking about collaborating. You know, we, we do that, uh, maybe not day zero, but it, it's important that it's an early, early conversation in research collaboration. That's how we make things. Get the difficult stuff out of the way. How are we gonna share the money from the grant how are we gonna approach publications? Let's get that out of the way. Then we can focus on substance. So some people think I'm too business-like when I try to do that, but you know, I try to say to mm -hmm. them, that's the difficult stuff. Let's just mm -hmm. put it out of the way. And then we can focus on the fun, which is the science. <laughs>
Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for these thoughtful reflections. Okay, one question I must bring up. It's been sort of, uh, you. Uh, our panelists brought it up. I haven't seen it in the chat, but I, it's the elephant in the room or what, let's say the elephant on the globe right now, COVID. COVID is what I'm talking about. Has this changed anything in your mind? Um, is it for the better or for the worse in terms of power dynamics? Uh, Peter has brought it up. I just wanted maybe to, um, you know, have some, you know, more uh, deep reflections on on this. Uh, in fact, actually, in some ways, I'm wondering, you know, Pernima, um, what you brought up in terms of the journalist. Um, I don't know if this is even, you know, a side effect of COVID now. I'm finding journalists here in the States are getting much more thoughtful and sophisticated in terms of how they report public health information in a way that they certainly wouldn't, would not have in 2019. So in any case, um, just, you know, COVID and just your reflections on how this has changed the global landscape for the better or worse, over. And maybe we can start with Peter because I know he's brought it up several times. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I think COVID has its problems, but um, it has also brought opportunity uh, for, um, so for instance, here and in many countries, um, there was a lot of worry that uh, uh, Africa and Asia are the continents which are going to be affected the most. So people are saying, if you needed a, a ventilator, you can't get it here. So let's go home. <laughs> so um, uh, people either repatriated themselves or their governments. And then we remained here to deal with the issues with them, um, um, mainly by ourselves, but by a few other people who remained, but also, of course, collaborations uh, remained. And I'm sure many people are not flying and, uh, uh, but continue providing technical assistance in another way. But also allowing the locals to, to, to show their ability to uh, take lead, which was not usually the case. So for the case, but even the governments have woken up to, to know that uh, the local researchers actually exist, but they have not been funding them. So I think COVID has been an opportunity, one, to show that uh, these institutions actually can organize themselves once there is an issue and there's no, nowhere to run to. And uh, we can find a, another a good way to work with colleagues because we have not stopped working uh, with colleagues from elsewhere, but we are working uh, in a different way and uh, things are going on uh, generally. Um, uh, now, is this the change we need? I think it is the opportunity to reflect how should the world be uh, moving? As I said before, uh, nobody in the West is going to solve problems here uh, without us having the expertise. Even if you start something, we have to continue it. So we need to say that we, we need to allow the locals to lead and then be, uh, provide the necessary support where it is required. The governments have to come in. Now, will the opportunity uh, be, as, uh, would, where shall we take this opportunity forward? I think it remains a question. The world also forgets so fast. Uh, for instance, I would like to challenge uh, all of us panelists and those listening. What, is, what kind of agenda do we need uh, post COVID in terms of um, a world where developing countries are able to do uh, stuff uh, a lot by themselves uh, supported by uh, those who have better as, as technology and skill. So what kind of agenda and who is going to lead this discussion? And I'd like to recommend that this discussion must be there and find a new way of doing a business that uh, is led by locals that uh, uh, we work with and support. Over. Thank you. Any other reflections from other panelists on the COVID question? Better or worse? Where we stand? Um, Maybe just, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I mean, one of the things obviously is, is we've had this flood of information, like including information that purports to be science. And uh, this gets to the, the, the point that was discussed a little bit earlier about, about research getting publicly posted without having gone through peer review. Um, 
I think for better or worse, moving forward, I think we can expect that there's there's a, a lot more, there's going to be a lot more sharing of, of, of evidence uh, and, and probably more interest in, in say, pre-publication, like publication before peer review. Um, I think there's, there's a challenge there moving forward to ensure quality. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think there's, a, there's no reason to believe that we're going to re revert back to status quo ante. Like we're not going back to pre-COVID as far as how, uh, 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 kind of how widely and how early um, evidence gets shared. Uh, so I think we're going to have to kind of, kind of adjust to that new world. <laughs> I mean, maybe another final point is I, I think what we're experiencing today is participating in a conference on Zoom. So this is uh, kind, of, kind of required by current circumstances. Like, you know, it, it's nice when you're actually at a conference in person, like there's all kinds of informal interaction that can happen that we're missing. At the same time, uh, I mean, this platform has, has enabled much broader participation than we would have with an in-person conference. So I think again, like Zoom and, and kind of interacting uh, virtually, um, I think moving forward, that's gonna be a big plus. I think this, this connects the system more to itself in the way that uh, Shay was discussing early on. Yeah, uh, so Steve, let me pick up on that because I, I think um, I agree that COVID has changed some of the, the North-South um, kind of, you know, it's a different equation because, you know, the more typical, um, the researchers from sort of the top global health schools around the world are not able to travel to, you know, the countries where their research collaborations are. That just means, you know, a different way of, you know, of operating. Um, in countries, you know, certainly the folks who are here are the ones who have to engage and figure out how to get things done and, and how to support local uh, local governments. And so I, so I think it's been uh, really fascinating. Uh, in India, for example, the uh, Gates Foundation India office supported a secretariat that has basically brought together a network of all researchers doing uh, research in, in health and the indirect effects of COVID. So not the infectious, you know, the pandemic and, and the rollout of that, but people looking at indirect effects. And so we have a platform of about 40, 45 research institutions that are connected and, and doing things together. And it's mostly, you know, I want to say maybe 95% of those are groups that are right here. But the other thing that has become very interesting because of this technology and, and because travel within countries is also not possible, nor is travel in the region, uh, I have found that networks of national researchers are collaborating more because we have the technology platform. We hosted a conference in, in September uh, that had over 1800 people registered to join. We had sessions that were joined by three or 400 people. I've hosted that same conference every year it's a conference to bring together, what did we learn this year on nutrition programs? It's an implementation science conference. And we've never been able to have more than hundred people because we've held it in a physical venue. And after the experience this year, I told myself, I said, this was amazing. We had researchers from all over the country uh, and even from other countries who could join us online and reflect on these issues. We certainly missed the in-person side of it, but we didn't miss the, engagement around the knowledge component. So I, I do reflect on these, you know, the positive things in a sense, if you can speak to that. Um, the, the last thing I wanna say on that one is that I, I think um, because so much is just happening in countries and locally, it's also really forced one to look at, you know, what is being published about the pandemic in and by local researchers versus say by, you know, other folks who are able to have access to data and are, are doing certain, you know, whether it's projections or other such things. And then you realize that what you also need is people who can aggregate knowledge, you know, so the, the knowledge leaders or translators in the local ecosystems who have to basically be able to say, okay, that's what the IHME model said. That's what the Imperial model said. This is what our local model said. How do we put it together and what does it mean for here? Um, or to say, you know what, we have nobody with no institutions with modeling capacity in our countries. 
Right. So, so you also you you kind of get to see both the the need for aggregating knowledge from you know the same thing, but that's coming from three different. I mean, India is crazy. There's about twenty different modeling groups probably modeling the the rollout of the pandemic. Um, but also you see you see the gaps. You know, who is are there people to do the aggregation? Are there people to do the things that are needed in country? And so I really hope that you know country is not just you know low and middle income but across the board people will take a look at what is the knowledge system that we needed to deal with a crisis that in a sense hit all of us i don't think we've ever had you know a crisis like this that hit high income countries and low income countries the same you know with sort of the same uh, I don't know, force um, and in exactly the same time frame. You know, it's not like the UK didn't have diarrhea or cholera, but that was many, many, many years ago. <laughs> but this is something that's happening, you know, at the same time everywhere. And you're seeing the holes everywhere. We are seeing the holes in the high income countries. We are seeing them in the low and middle income countries. So it's a really good time to have a conversation about global health for real, global. So COVID, I think, gives us that opportunity. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks. Tell you what, I'm going to cut us off in three minutes um, from the questions and answers because I do need to have a quick wrap up. But I, we do have three minutes. And so here, lightning round, last question that I can, and I, you get to choose one of these two. Um, organic and local, what does scale look like? Um, that's one to reflect on. And um, knowledge to action, you know, how is that figuring into our discussion? Um, it's one thing to publish research. It's another thing to apply it. Um, what do we think about the hierarchies here and the, um, the barriers, that sort of thing? So these are the last two questions. You get to choose one of them. You know, maybe I can give you one minute each to reflect on one or the other of those before we wrap this up. So uh, whoever wants to go first. Anyone feeling very, uh, uh, Steve is unmuted. You know, we could have you go first here, Steve. <laughs> well, just very quickly then. I mean, as far as knowledge to action is concerned, there's this kind of traditional notion, kind of unidirectional pipeline notion, that kind of knowledge translation. I mean, I think that's something that we got to put behind us. And there, you know, this is kind of consistent, I think with uh, what Shay was saying uh, uh, earlier is we, we need to find ways of, um, bringing together knowledge producers and, and knowledge users, uh, you know, so, uh, so at the end of the day, we're making the best possible use of, of evidence and learning and, and, and experience to direct decisions. Thanks, Steve. Um, our other panelists, any reflection on one or the other of those questions? Maybe I'll comment on the knowledge traction. It's, um, for me, it's one of the most frustrating areas I've raised it. I've raised it here in Uganda that um, we have trials that claim reduced um, child mortality by 30 percent. We recently did a trial which reduced um, preterm mortality by 30 percent. But how, why aren't these successes never getting into practice? So there is a, and it's not that the government doesn't know. They know, but maybe they are so dependent on on WHO guidelines, and they need to do, to use. The local knowledge. So the question could also be that could be like, how can uh, local knowledge be used to develop uh, local guidelines? <laughs> Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, Pranima, you get the last yeah, both, go. Both real, real great questions. But um, I want to, I want to talk about the uh, the local and scale. Um, I, I, I don't think the two are incompatible at all. And in fact, in many, many countries, because they're large and because you're working with, you know, um, large scale health platforms, et cetera, a lot of local research ends up being very, very scalable. Uh, so if you, again, I, you know, I mentioned the research with the ASHA platforms or the uh, community-based nutrition program in India or the health extension platform in Ethiopia or the lady health worker platforms in, in Pakistan, I mean, any research you do within those, you know, already at scale kind of programs ends up being, you know, potentially very scalable. I think the problem is more if more about, you know, are you doing a boutique project that puts in a lot of resources 
And that's to me not a local versus scale issue. It's a pilot versus scale issue. Um, so yeah, you know, I, 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 in many cases, often the research that is done and and designed by people with a good knowledge of the system and a good knowledge of what will it take to to get the knowledge to be used will end up being you know being done in ways that's relevant and and potentially scalable. Uh, but to me, that's a different issue from you know inclusion and and not south. So let's leave it at that. Thank you. Such okay, great well, questions. Well, thanks so much. And I know there's other ones that I apologize to anyone whose question we were not able to get to. Thank you again so much to all our panelists who've given us various perspectives on this really important issue. It gets to be more getting more and more traction in today's world, which I'm really happy about. The question of uh, reimagining how we produce and consume research. I'd like to thank not only our panelists, but also Natalie Culbertson, the managing editor of uh, Global Health Science and Practice, as well as Holly O'Hara and Andrea Surrett from um, uh, Momentum Country and Global Leadership, who've done an immense amount of work to prepare for this panel. So really appreciate all the back end work that you've done to make sure that this came off without any flaws. And I wanna just close by announcing that the panelists have decided we're gonna form a group um, to uh, stay together and consider these issues. We're hoping to be able to uh, publish something. We're not sure in what form. <laughs> um, so that might not be surprising given the discussion we just had. So anyone who wants to remain in touch, um, we on the last slide of the slides, which will be uh, made uh, available, are a couple of email addresses. There they are to be able to get in touch with us and um, we really appreciate all of your very thoughtful participation. So thanks so much to the panelists. Thanks so much to participants and the conversation will continue. <laughs>